my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day and welcome to episode 70 of the podcast. And today I'm going to share a dream goddess with you. This is a goddess quilt that I started in 2014 and it is right now being blocked on my table downstairs and I need to prep up the facing. This is an alternative to binding. So what I'm going to do is during the episode today, I'm going to talk through what I'm working on uh, and share with you how I'm facing, planning to face this really big wall hanging uh, and be preparing and cutting those uh, strips and then all also talk through what this quilt was all about, uh, why it took four years to create, uh, what I plan to do differently next time, you know, pretty much that whole, you know, there's just, there's just uh, so much that we can learn from any particular quilt, particularly these really, really big over the top quilts. And this quilt has a lot of personal meaning to me. Uh, it is it is asking, in my opinion, one of the most important questions that we can ask. What life do we want to have? What do we want to be building? What do we want to be growing towards? What do we want to be moving towards? And that's what Dream Goddess is all about. So I'm really looking forward to sharing this with you. I don't know how exactly it's going to work out because, of course, I'm going to be cutting facing and pressing and doing all kinds of different stuff. So bear with me today. It's going to be kind of a weird episode. Uh, and I do want you to know that you can find video in addition to audio. If you're just listening to the audio of this podcast, you can also find video, too. You can find that at leahday.com slash dream. That's where you can find Dream Goddess. Uh, lots of close-up images and lots of um, kind of videos throughout the process because this is a quilt that's taken so many years. I have oftentimes turned on the camera and shot a little bit here and there. So I'm going to link up, try and link up everything that I've ever shared about this all in one place. So you can find that at leahday.com slash dream. So what am I working on today as I share the intro? Uh, this is a playing card and I picked up this pack, I told you about this a couple weeks ago, and they were just really disappointing illustrations. And I looked at it and I was like, well, if I get the right pen, I think I can draw and practice different quilting designs. And these are feathers. I'm kind of on a feather kick. And this is feathers combined with uh, spider webs, which is a pretty cool combination. I'm really liking this. So. I'm going to be drawing on this and finishing up this card. I just have a little bit left to do. And something I realized, I'm always checking in on my goals. I'm always kind of, you know, just looking at, all right, what do I need to focus some time on? What do I need to uh, pay more attention to or just, just give a little bit more time to? And I realized that drawing is a major thing that I need to have daily practice, a daily check-in at least, uh, and if not daily, then at least weekly. And that's why I started Sketch Saturday. Sketchy Saturday. <laughs> it's something kind of fun. Uh, it's just going to be a blog post on the Free Motion Quilting Project. So you can find it at freemotionproject.com. And every Saturday, I'm going to share, you know, just a sketch that I'm working on, something that I'm drawing, thinking about, uh, and, you know, not necessarily perfect. I have said before, I don't necessarily consider myself an artist and drawing skills have always been something that I felt like I needed to do better building those skills. But I gotta say, I just finished the cover art for Mally the Maker and there's something about this that has just really, it's changed my attitude about my drawing skills. It really, really has. Uh, seeing these sketches come together and they're looking amazing and I'm so pleased with them. And then designing the cover art and putting this together. I mean, I don't know if it's going to translate to sales. I mean, you know, there's, there's, you know, cover art, there's whole cover art tutorials on, on making a good cover that, you know, does good in bookstores and does good on Amazon and all that kind of stuff. I designed what I thought fit the book the best. And I'm kind of cross my fingers that it works out and does well. But um, yeah, Mally the Maker and the Queen in the Quilt. And here is the cover art. It is done. The book is uploaded. The title is right now in pre-media, but hopefully this week I will be able to order my very first sample copy. And this is awesome because it actually finally feels real. After working on this book for nearly a year, this novel, it finally feels like this is real and it's coming all together. And yeah, I'm 
super excited. <laughs> um, you know, when something, you know, especially these big projects, I mean, it just, it feels like it's never going to be done, you know, and it's kind of magical in that, you know, um, in that way where it's, you know, I couldn't really even envision it, you know, what it was going to look like as it was finished. And I also did not give myself permission to draw as I was writing, which, you know, coming now at this perspective at the very, very end, I'm kind of like, well, I wish I'd been drawing. I wish I'd been playing with these ideas because then those drawings would have influenced the writing rather than the other way around. You know, it would have been a lot more cohesive. Well, the main reason I think I didn't do the drawing as I was writing the book is I had no idea what the layout process was going to be like. And I had no idea what those finished sizes of those drawings were going to needed to be, you know, and I, you know, and I'm kind of one of those people that unless I have a system in place and like, I'm going to make this many designs in this size and I'm going to do it for this many months, I'm kind of like, I'm one of those system type of people. Like these cards are really working for me because it's like, there are 52 cards in a deck and uh, there were only 16 cards that were drawn on. So I have let's see, 40 some odd cards that I have left to draw and, and play with. And so that's a system that works for me. It works for my brain. And it's something that I can easily pick up and go, okay, I, I finished this card. Let me go get another card. You know, I designed free mission quilting designs the exact same way. I decided on the four inch square that's you know where I, I decided to do my size. Uh, I could cut a six inch square of fabric in order to have space to hang on to it. That's how I designed all of the 365 and then now we're nearly at 500 free motion quilting designs. So it's kind of like I, I realize that's just a really important part of my brain. I need to know the size that I need and I have a hard time drawing and designing when I don't know what size something needs to be. And the cover art was exactly that way. You know, I didn't know, do I need to, you know, cover the whole piece of paper? You know, like how big is the cover gonna be? Like what's the bleed and what's the spine? And I actually had, the cover art was a beast. The day that I was uploading that, it kept spitting it back at me. You know, it kept saying um, spot color error. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> you know, I'm a quilter. I'm not a graphic designer. I, you know, and it, uh, I was like yelling at my computer and stuff and finally realized that I had left some guiding rectangles on the layer in the program. And all I needed to do was delete them and then everything went through just fine. You know, it's just like little, I, I told you about this uh, last week, little glitches can happen that can stall the book and that can end up stalling the book for days. Uh, just little glitches like that, that are so frustrating and you know, that make me start screaming at my computer. Uh, and it, it always ends up being just some small little thing that just needs a little bit of a tweak. Um, but I have to say, finishing this cover art, and I haven't seen the sample copy of the book yet. I'm hoping I'll be able to order the sample copies this week. But as soon as I saw the finished cover art, it was like, wow, you know, I really did do that. And I think that this is really important. We need to be pushing ourselves to the point where it's like, can I do that? I don't know if I can do that. I feel a little hesitant, but I'm going to try it anyway. And then at the end, you're like, oh, wow, I did that. <laughs> that's so cool. Uh, I think that's what we should always be aiming towards, you know, um, the, the risky push and, in a new direction and to just try it and see what happens. And then, yay. And I mean, hey, if I had needed to hire somebody else to do the cover art, that wouldn't have been the end of the world either. But especially at this point, it's like, if I can design an 80 inch giant show winning quilt, I think I could design some cover art, you know? Uh, so it was just, it was fun. And uh, definitely an adventure and definitely something I am super, super excited about and pleased about. I cannot wait to show you the book. Hopefully next week. I'm crossing my fingers that I get a sample copy in by next week. We'll see. So that's been a really big deal. Uh, and then crazy thing, as soon as I finished the cover art and got the, the block of the book uh, laid out and everything done for Mally the Maker, it's like all of a sudden I had this overwhelming finishing energy. I don't know, I, I don't talk about this very much, but there are different types of energy that we carry into different projects and different people have kind of leaned towards one or the other. If you have a quilting friend or you yourself, 
start a lot of projects, then you know what starting energy feels like. Starting energy is that rush, like, oh, I'm so excited, you know, and you've got all this energy and you're pulling out fabric and you're getting things starched up and ready to go and you've got that quilt pattern, you're so excited. That's starting energy, it's overwhelming. You're, you're you know, basically you've got, um, the fire in your pants <laughs> to get everything done. Uh, I've designed a quilt that I feel some serious starting energy on this quilt. I wanna race off and go and start cutting out fabric and get this into my uh, graphics design program and start playing. But here's the thing, starting energy can very quickly kind of get uh, not really hijacked, but just you can start to run out of that energy pretty quickly as soon as you get into the nitty gritty and as soon as things get hard, you know, that's when you lose your starting energy and you really have to fall back on just your kind of plodding steady energy to get you through the project. And that's where a lot of people, including myself, lose steam. I know that if I run off on that quilt design right this second and start pulling out fabric and cutting stuff up, I'm gonna be moving too fast. I don't have the quilting design planned for it yet. So that's automatically a red flag. I don't start a quilt until I know how I'm going to quilt it. You know, especially if it's going to be a show quilt, which that one I think is. Uh, that's another uh, blog post you can find on the Free Mission Quilting Project. I am going to get back into show quilting after doing that podcast episode about show quilting. I was like, I've, I've got to get back into this. I've got to question the, my beliefs about show quilting. I don't know if it's actually really that hard or really that time consuming. Maybe I've just convinced myself of that. And then it also just, you know, I went to a quilt guild uh, meeting and at Charlotte. I've joined the Charlotte Quilt Guild and uh, there was an excellent presentation with Philippa Naylor and I actually bought her book. It's absolutely excellent. Uh, and that's mostly what she does. She is a, a British quilter and she shares um, awesome designs and uh, beautiful quilts in shows. She mostly is a show quilter and she's won lots and lots of awards. She's written two books, I believe, and then she mostly travels and teaches. Uh, and I just found that uh, whole uh, lecture and presentation very very inspiring her quilts are just absolutely gorgeous and she's won in so many different categories she's just a very very well-rounded quilter uh, so yeah I just found that really inspiring and then I thought why can't I quilt for show uh, and the, I think the main reason was you know I've been working through this goddess quilt series that uh, just feels really really special and precious to me and uh, like I didn't want to send those quilts out uh, just in case something happened to them. I didn't want to send those quilts out. Well, I thought about it some more. It's like, well, I can still design quilts that, you know, mean something that are meaningful, but aren't, you know, so personal that I get real precious about it. So that's what I've decided to do. I'm going to start working on a new series of quilts and showing again and tackling my issues with filling out forms. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's all really, really good. Uh, and I feel really positive about that. But getting back to energy, uh, we have starting energy, explain that. I'm sure you, you feel that whenever you're cutting out fabric for a new quilt. Uh, we have that middle of the road energy. That's just kind of like what plods us along, what gets us through something. Uh, and then usually what's hard is that whenever we hit uh, roadblocks, whenever things stop going so easily, whenever the fabric isn't working out right or things are cut wrong or the, the seams aren't lining up, you know, something frustrating happens and we kind of slow down. And that's when it's really easy to just put one project aside and go fuel up again with that starting energy and start something new. And I'll be honest, I, I run into this and uh, am, am a complete starting energy junkie <laughs> to a large degree. I find it a lot harder to finish things and to really get deep into finishing energy. That's the energy that you get whenever you see that you're almost there. And then it's like, oh my gosh, I'm so close to finishing. Let's knock this out. And that energy, for me at least, is a lot harder to generate. Um, I have to really psychologically be in the mood to finish. Uh, especially Dream Goddess had a lot of issues where it was like, I knew I did not want to bind the quilt in a traditional way. I knew I wanted to do a facing on the quilt. This is harder for me. I don't do that as often. I have a method, but 
again, I don't do that every week or every month. I do that maybe once every three or four years. So I've got to go dig up those notes and figure out what I'm doing and, and remember how to do that, that technique. Uh, so it requires more effort. Uh, so it's kind of like I had to psychologically overcome all of those barriers to finishing this quilt, uh, you know, just finishing the quilting because I knew the next step was the binding, the facing. Uh, the same thing with Mally the Maker. I had the cover art kind of hanging over my head with this layout. I knew as soon as I finished the layout, I needed to go do the cover art. But I expected the book to be spat back at me a few times for the layout. There were no issues at all all. I didn't get a single flag on the layout at all, which is like mind blown. <laughs> I've never done the layout on a novel before, so I was expecting issues. There weren't any issues. And that just goes to show, sometimes I think, this is just a little tangent, using the right program can make the biggest difference in the world. And I am finally using the Adobe Industry Standard programs. I'm using InDesign to lay out my book, Illustrator to do all of the illustrations. Uh, I've had to play a little bit with Photoshop, not, you know, not a lot, but a little bit with Photoshop too. And, you know, it's worth it. It's worth it to have the right programs for the job. I've resisted that for years and I, you know, to my regret, it's honestly absolutely 100% worth it to do it the right way and use the right programs. Okay, uh, but then there was one other thing that I, I was suddenly like, oh man, I'm almost at the end, I can finish this. And that was my crocheted sweater. I finally got one sleeve on my crocheted sweater too. So it's like everything is coming together and the finishing energy from Mally the Maker fueled finishing Dream Goddess and then that fueled finishing my crocheted sweater, my, my uh, freeform cro uh, sweater that I've been working on while I've been editing Mally the Maker. So it's like I'm now a finishing energy junkie. <laughs> And it's great because I'm finishing up all of these different projects and that is making me realize, wow, you know, sometimes I'll get bogged down and stuck on something for years just simply because I'm not able to tap into that. And I need to kind of, I guess, in a way, funnel it. So I need to take the finishing energy from one project and say, okay, I finished that one. That's super, super easy. Instead of starting something new, go straight into finishing another project and try and chain it together so that I, it's like, yes, I finished that. And yes, I finished that. And yes, I finished that. I think that's really, really good. So uh, think about that a little bit. I know that was kind of a tangent in all different directions, but finishing energy, starting energy. Think about that and let me know uh, what you tend to lean towards. Do you start a lot of projects and then lose steam and then end up with them in bins? That's how we get all of those unfinished, unquilted quilt tops. Uh, or are you a finisher? Do you carry a project through and then just knock out all the way to the end uh, and enjoy that finishing process? Which, which works best for you or what energy do you feel like you uh, run with the most. Because I've heard from a lot of quilters that say they only buy fabric for a specific project. They carry that project all the way through to the end. And then after that project is finished, then they buy more fabric and start a new project. I think that's wonderful. It's not I, I'm not able to do that. I, I'll be honest, I'm not able to to be that um, uh, what is the word? I would say logical. <laughs> I'm not able to be that logical. I'm also, I, I don't know, I, I guess I just always want to really enjoy that that starting energy that I'm always so excited that I'm always ready to start something new and not necessarily ready to carry it all the way through to completion. Something I'm working on, definitely. Okay, so yeah, that's an update on Mally the Maker. And yes, I finished up my little sketch just as I was sitting here talking to you and you can see it here. I think that turned out really, really good. Feathers are so fun. And, and it's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately is just how the feather motif fills in, fits in just about any space. It is, you know, in my opinion, a universal quilting design. It's a universal quilting symbol. Uh, it's beautiful, it's flowing, and just about any design can work in the background around it. And I think that's something really interesting about feathers. Uh, downstairs on Dream God is something I noticed. I had some ripply fabric and some issues, and, I, and I'll, I'll share about that in more detail uh, during the episode. Uh, but one thing I noticed is I could let my feathers get big. I mean, like two inches around 
uh, around the curve and even those big ones weren't showing a lot of signs of ripply fabric. It was when I was doing kind of long, uh, long lines, long curving lines that I would oftentimes get ripples, especially when they got the space between the lines of quilting got too wide. So, you know, even though I've made mistakes in this quilt, I'm learning from it and I'm kind of going, huh, okay, I can get away with this. I can get away with big giant honk and feathers, <laughs> but I can't get away with big giant wide lines combined with extremely dense quilting, you know? And this is the reason why I think I wanna get back into show quilting is it's just an exploration. It's saying, I wonder if this will work. I wonder if I can get away with this try it out, see what happens. You know, it's one thing to try something out on something four inches wide, something six inches wide, something tiny. You can pretty much get away with anything because it's so small. When you start to expand something and get into the 40 to 60 inch range, especially when you're getting into the 80 inch range, you know, fabric starts misbehaving really, really easily. And, you know, something that was easy to get away with on a small scale just completely goes out the window on a large scale. And this is what I'm curious about. I don't think I'm gonna go big with these quilts though, this new show quilting series. I just don't have time to go big. Uh, I, and I looked, I checked out several different show quilts, uh, show entry forms. I was just kind of curious, like what's the minimum? <laughs> what's the smallest size that I can get away with? I don't wanna go miniature, not my style. I mean, although I love miniature quilts, I think they're magical. Um, miniature quilts aren't really my thing. Uh, and, I, and I'm not big into um, trying to miniaturize something that's supposed to be big and shrinking it down. Just, it doesn't work for me. So instead I'm gonna focus on small wall hangings that I'm thinking around the range of 40 inches wide will probably be about my max. And the good news is show quilting, um, usually the minimum width is 30 inches. So I've got some play there. I could go anywhere from 35 to 40 inches be able to create a beautiful quilt, uh, be able to compete, but not half the, you know, kind of the uh, monkey on my back of an 80 inch quilt or a 60 inch quilt. That's just so much more time consuming to complete. So I'm excited about that. It's gonna be a fun challenge and I I'm looking forward to being able to share more about that with you. Uh, now, last week I shared something really important and, and it was really, really scary. A whole podcast episode for 69 was about why I uh, was archiving my groups on Facebook. And I was really worried that I was going to get a lot of, um, a lot of anger and uh, upset quilters and, you know, people feeling disappointed and mad at me and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I received actually the complete opposite. And I just wanted to share some of the comments that I received on that post on YouTube. Um, just overwhelmingly, everyone was so, so super positive. Uh, so David said, congratulations to you both. And yeah, just so you know, this was a joint decision between Josh and I, because Josh actually was doing the bulk of the work maintaining these Facebook groups and keeping them clean and keeping them nice. So David said, congratulations to you both on the move and thank you for your open and heartfelt message. I shut down my presence on Facebook a couple years ago as an indie wool dyer and haven't looked back. Those who want to find me continue to find me and those members of the dreaded cesspool are a thing of the past. I restrict myself to Instagram these days and find my time spent within my circle of crafters to be continually rewarding the way it should be. And that was actually my, my, uh, my term, dreaded cesspool, was just basically that Facebook is encouraging people to not be nice to one another. And, and that's, you know, it was just so much effort. It was taking so much time and effort to keep the groups clean and, and to stop people from being horrible to one another. That's really silly. You know, we're, we're adults, <laughs> we're quilters. Number one, we should be quilting. And then number two, uh, we should always be fostering kindness. Uh, so another comment from Jennifer from The Sewing Report, and she has a YouTube channel. Definitely go and check it out, Sewing Report uh, on YouTube. She said, really appreciate your, you sharing your honest thoughts about quilters and social media. I completely agree. Facebook can be both a great place to build community, but on a flip side, it can be hostile and divisive. Totally respect and applaud your decision. Let's focus on making things without so much pressure and stress. Yes! If we're doing Facebook, we are not creating, we are not quilting, we have to make beautiful things. I think making beautiful things, even coloring a silly little five of diamonds card is making the world a more beautiful place. This made me happy today. Uh, and that I think is the key ultimately. 
Uh, one more comment from Lori. She said, my husband and I dropped off Facebook a few years ago due to cyberbullying, narcissism, and inappropriate content that it seems to promote. So kudos to you for taking charge. It's okay to no longer want to be sucked down that rabbit hole. Life is too short and there are more important and beautiful aspects of life to devote our time to. I've seen some pretty nasty mean comments on YouTube too, so here's to hoping this format isn't overrun with bullies. I guess some individuals weren't ever taught if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything. Personally, I'm so grateful for the kind individuals such as yourself that are willing to freely share their artistry to novices like myself so novices like myself can learn. Um, and yes, YouTube is also guilty for having bad comments. I actually got a bad comment today. And the thing I always tap into is uh, looking at um, not letting my negativity bias overwhelm uh, the positive. So that one negative comment, I had 20 or more positive comments, but that one negative comment is so easy to focus on. It's so easy to get obsessive about that one negative person, that one person being mean, uh, because we're hardwired to focus on negativity. That's just part of who we are as human beings. Uh, so it's, it's really hard to, um, to say, okay, here's this person being mean to me, but I'm going to go focus more and, and add, uh, give more credibility to all of these positive, kind comments. It's hard to do that, but um, that's really where it's at. That's what we've got to do as quilters, as makers, as business owners. We've got to look for the positive, and we've got to work towards making the world a more beautiful, wonderful, kind place. Uh, some people have mentioned that, you know, um, some of the negativity is being taken offline, and I think that this is absolutely the case. You know, I like to believe that people are more kind in person, but even I myself have been seeing where, you know, tempers are shorter, people are not as uh, polite. And I think that this is very much, it could be even being caused by social media, where if you've just, you know, had your feelings hurt on Facebook, it's that much easier to take that and offload it on somebody else. And I think we just need to really be paying attention to the cycle of behavior. Uh, and remember, you know, our, our thoughts, whatever we're thinking, it, it affects our feelings, it becomes our feelings, and our feelings become our actions. It's a triangle, you know, thoughts and feelings and actions, and it keeps spinning around. And I really do feel like getting off of Facebook and minimizing my social media presence there has been really, really good. I have also taken all notifications off my phone. So uh, I will post to Instagram, but I no longer am getting like all of the pings and likes and comments and stuff on my phone, which was always kind of pulling me out of whatever I was doing. It was always a distraction. It was always like, oh, let me go see what so-and-so said, you know, um, taking that away. It is now like I just pick up my phone when I need to take a photo instead of picking up my phone to check and see what everyone said about something. It's, it's, it's changing my behavior. And I feel a little bit of withdrawal about this, but... I think it's really, really good. And it, it's returning my phone to why I bought it. I bought it to be a phone and to be a camera and that's it. Uh, and I think that's important to just pay attention to that and um, pay attention to the behavior. If you feel like something has turned into an addiction that you feel like an obsession about checking it, just think about that. Try and take a fast uh, on it, you know, meaning just, just kind of cold turkey, shut it down and, and turn off your notifications and see how you feel. I think more than anything else, that's the most important thing. And after a week, uh, I am feeling really, really good. I'm feeling really positive about this. And thankfully, 100% um, supportive comments online. And that is really something. So I really want to just say thank you so much to everyone that was supportive and kind. Uh, and you know, finds us on YouTube and continues to enjoy the videos. And please continue to post comments and share your suggestions and any questions that you have. I love to make videos for you that are on the topics that you want to learn more about. So I'm always looking for suggestions as well. So uh, a few last things. Uh, reading two excellent books that I wanted to share with you that are rocking my world, Foolproof Dictation and Foolproof Outline. Uh, and they're both written by the same guy, Christopher Downing. I heard a podcast episode with this guy um, on Joanna Penn's The Creative Pen Podcast. It's a writing podcast, and I'm a writer. Uh, so it's very important to me to um, be looking at healthy ways of writing. You know, typing on a computer 
all day could potentially affect my hands down the line. Uh, so the uh, foolproof dictation is something big I'm getting into. I'm actually gonna go get a new headset mic today. Uh, and I'm gonna start dictating everything from comments to emails to blog posts to books. And the reason being, um, you know, thinking words and typing, that's, you know, kind of taking words, you know, through your, your brain to your hands. And there's a lot going on between those two things. When you dictate, it's basically going from your brain to your mouth. It's a shorter, it's, it's, it's a shorter line. Uh, it does take practice. And that's what I love about the foolproof dictation book is he really gives you exercises to work through. So if your hands are hurting, if you are wanting to write, if you're wanting to create something uh, and the idea of typing or you're a bad typist, uh, any of those issues that are coming in your way, I really encourage these books. Foolproof Outline is more for fiction novel writing, but I think it can be very helpful if you're wanting to write a quilting book, um, just thinking about how that book is structured and how you're going to put that together in a logical way. I have started the outline for Mally the Maker book two, and it's so exciting. Um, this book feels already super solid in my head, and that's super exciting because uh, with the dictation techniques, I plan to write this book a lot faster than book number one. Uh, and that's good because I've left a few little like question marks in book number one that everybody's gonna be like, what happens next? <laughs> that's what you want. That's what you want in a book series. But even still, I, I need to make sure I get book two out pretty quickly. so. I don't have a lot of people really disappointed with me uh, for a long period of time. So I think that this is really good and I'm really excited about using these two books uh, and writing more without my hands with my mouth instead at uh, just dictating. And this is also uh, along with my goals of being a healthier quilter. Uh, I'm exercising daily now with an app called Seven. It's seven minute exercises and the goal is to do it every day for seven months. Uh, so exercise daily and then doing the dictation standing rather than sitting because so much of what I do is setting to instead move to standing desks. So I am dictating as I'm standing and being more of a physical person, at least on my feet. I think all of that is really, really good. Uh, we have to think about how we're living uh, because, you know, if certain things are starting to become a challenge, like standing up for an hour or two on end, you know, that is affecting our health and we need to really pay attention to this, or at least this is something that I find that's really important. I don't want to wake up one day and uh, my hands hurt uh, too much that I can't uh, do hand applique or, I, you know, and that's being caused by writing. I don't want to one day not be able to stand at my long arm uh, and be able to quilt standing up because, you know, I, I've basically been sitting down in a chair uh, for months and months and months on end. So just different things that I'm thinking about, just because Becoming a better, uh, healthier quilter, healthier woman, uh, and more active, more than anything else. So one last thing, we have started our Leaf Peepers quilt along, and here is the quilt. I'm so excited to be sharing this with you with my friend Sherry from Whole Circle Studio. And we both shared our very first post for this quilt along. Uh, you can learn how to cut fabric and organize all your pieces. And there are lots of little itsy bitsy pieces with this quilt. Uh, you can find a post from that on Sherry's blog. You can find a post of five piecing tips for beginners on mine. So come and check out these posts. You can find everything linked up at leahday.com slash leaf. And that's also where you can find the quilt pattern so you can join in the fun. It's never too late to join in my quilt alongs. The videos will stay up forever and you're gonna learn so many fun techniques with this project, not just how to piece. We're also gonna learn how to quilt it. Sherry's gonna be teaching walking foot quilting. I'm gonna teach ruler foot quilting and free motion quilting. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. And by the time we get this finished, it will be fall and the leaves will be changing color. <laughs> so it'll be the perfect project to have the quilt finished in time to decorate for this wonderful season. So I hope that you'll come and check that out at leahday.com slash leaf. And now here's the episode about dream goddess and I'm going to be kind of actively working on the facing uh, and talking through the process of making this quilt, what it represents to me, why it took so long to finish it. Hello my quilting friends, my name is Leah Day and welcome to episode 70 of the podcast. And right now I am in the middle of blocking Dream Goddess 
And this is what this post is going to be about. I want to share what this quilt is, um, you know, the symbolism behind it, basically the quilt story of Dream Goddess, uh, as I take all the pins out that have been used to blocker and then also prepare all of the facing. Now, facing is an alternative to a traditional quilt binding. You know, whenever you bind a quilt, you end up with that you know, quarter to half inch bit of fabric all the way around the edge, and that forms kind of a frame around your quilt. Well, on certain quilts like art quilts, that's not something that you want. And you might have been looking around going, hey, is there an alternative? And the alternative is called facing. And it basically is kind of like um, facing on a shirt, a really nice uh, shirt. Uh, and that is kind of the, um, the piece of fabric that folds under and is stitched to the inside of a collar. Uh, you know, it's not, a, it's not as common because everything we wear now is knits and knits don't need to be faced, but anytime that you have a heavy weight fabric, such as a velvet, uh, you know, something like that, usually has a facing. And uh, when it comes to quilts, basically, if you wanna think about it, it is a strip of fabric for something this big, I'm planning on cutting my facing four inches wide. Uh, for something smaller, like one of the Eternal Love Goddess quilts, I'm probably gonna run a test to see if this technique works first on one of those Eternal Love Goddess quilts. I'm planning on cutting the facing only two inches wide for the smaller quilt. So basically strip a fabric, you fold under one edge, stitch it all the way around the quilt, <laughs> So you basically surround the quilt with the strips of fabric and then fold it to the back so that the entire edge of the quilt folds over. So you're actually rolling the edge of the quilt over. So some of this is gonna end up on the back. And I can already tell you actually, some of this is gonna get cut away uh, because the quilt right now is far from square. Uh, it is not square, the sides are not straight. There is no straight anything on this quilt, which is actually a good thing because because there are no intentional horizontal or vertical lines on this quilt, there is no way that I can be wrong <laughs> whenever I go to square it up. And that's a valuable thing. That's something I actually learned from another goddess quilt, um, both Shadow Self, uh, and uh, I think I also struggled with this a little bit with Hot Cast, where I had very obvious, very definite straight lines uh, in those quilts and then you know, the nature of quilting is wiggly wobbly, then it became very, very obvious that some stuff was off. Um, you know, your eye can catch it from a distance, you see it from a distance, and that's gonna be something that, you know, if it gets shown, then a quilt show judge is definitely gonna flag it. Um, on this, I knew from the beginning, I didn't want straight lines on the quilt if I could avoid it, or at least not horizontal and vertical. Obviously in the sky section, I've got this great big giant sun. It's kind of a landscape with a sun rising over the hair of the goddess and uh you know that you know the rays of the sun are straight lines but they're not vertical or horizontal which means i can get away with them being just a little bit wibbly wobbly and they are the thing that i learned the most just kind of going through it i've been taking some time obviously to do the blocking i steamed a uh, good section of this quote was having a lot of ripples towards the middle and a lot of ripples. This wasn't wanting to lay flat towards the top. This is just what happens. I'm telling you straight up, my quilts are not perfect, far from it. Uh, but steam does a lot and steam with wool, batting in particular, has a lot of power to, manip to manipulate your fabric and get it to behave. And so I have managed to get this thing relatively flat and you know under control by using a handheld steamer and uh, working at it. Uh, but I think the thing that I've been noticing more than anything else with the quilting is I pushed it too far. I left too many spaces wide open. And this is not me being critical of myself. I really want you to understand that whenever, at, at this stage of the process, it's really easy to get frustrated, bogged down, uh, angry that things didn't work out well, all of that stuff. It's really easy to go there. Uh, and, and I promise you I've been there before too. Uh, but the, the better thing to do is to instead look at it and go, okay, what have I learned? You know, uh, what in this quilt 
have I learned not to do again and why I will not repeat that same mistake again? Because, you know, it's one thing to make a mistake. It's another thing to make that same mistake again and again and again. <laughs> so I just want to make sure that I don't do that. Um, basically, I know that um, these spaces, I left these kind of wide lines in the sky section. And I think at their widest, it looks like it's about an inch and a half wide, kind of lines that are radiating out and getting wider and wider apart as they get closer and closer to the edge. And it looks like it's about a one and a half inch open space. Uh, some of these are pushing two inches towards the corners. It's too much space left open. I'm getting ripple, like a ripply fabric effect here, right down the center of those channels. Um, I'm getting some buckling in certain, uh, in the middle of some of those channels as well, where I went in with very, very dense quilting. Uh, I knew that area was gonna be difficult, or that at least has been the area that has caused me the most problems. And I'll, I'll come back to that and explain why uh, I think that area, the sky, it's this, it's the sunshine sky section that really was the reason why this quilt bogged down and did not get finished for four years. Uh, so, you know, a lot of lessons learned here. And, and that's what I really want to share with you in this podcast is that it's not perfect. It's far from perfect, but I am very, very happy with it. Uh, there have been multiple quilts that I've reached this point. And I've just been so frustrated and so depressed by, you know, like, oh man, it's just not what I wanted. And, you know, I put so much into it and it's not what I wanted. And, you know, really beat myself up about it, you know, and, and criticize my own skills. But, you know, here I'm able to look at this quilt and say, hey, there's some imperfection here. You know, hey, when I soaked it, the bathtub filled up with dye. <laughs> you know, it's still leaking dye. I didn't like to see that. Um, but I'm able to look at this now and say, you know, yeah, there's some issues. There's some mistakes. There's some pleaty fabric. There's some, there's some wrinkles and some blips and blobs and all that good stuff. Uh, but I still love it. And that's okay. I think she's gorgeous. She's exactly what she needs to be. Uh, and I'm ready to learn what I need to learn from this process and move on to the next thing. Dwelling on it, beating yourself up, hashing it out over and over and over again, looking at the quilt even though it's making you upset, all of that's bad. Uh, and, it, and it certainly won't make you a better quilter more than anything else. So you might be wondering a little bit about the blocking process. This is a process of basically soaking your quilt, stretching it out on, I'm using polystyrene boards. This is insulation sheeting. You can pin into it and it's really, really useful for this kind of thing because you can just pin straight into it and really get your quilt back into shape if needed. Uh, I have an entire tutorial on step-by-step -step blocking as far as taking a quilt, um, doing all of the steps, getting it back into shape, doing the pinning, all of that. Uh, you can find it in the Heart and Feather Whole Cloth Workshop. It's an excellent workshop for teaching you about whole cloth quilting, giving you all of the basics in a small project that will kind of just get you started on all of that if it's something that is interesting to you. Plus you get to learn trapunto, which is how I made all of these motifs, motif, <laughs> motifs, sorry, uh, really extra puffy and stand out. That is trapunto. And the basically, um, quick description, there's more than one layer of batting in those areas. And it's an awesome technique. I absolutely love it. It's one of my favorites to use, especially in show quilts. And uh, yeah, you can learn all of that in the Heart and Feather Whole Cloth Workshop. So taking out the pins, I'll be honest, I rarely do all of these pins through the middle of the quilt. This is actually fairly unusual and I'm having to kind of uh, <laughs> work my way around it here. Uh, probably should have taken out the pins before I hit record on the camera. That's okay. Um, but basically, she was so wiggly wobbly and this quilt was quilted from the face outward. You might not be able to see it. Here's a picture of the entire quilt. The face is not really in the center. It's more towards the lower edge. So I think that might have contributed to why I needed to pin so much to get the quilt flat. And then of course doing the steaming as well. You know, it's, it's one of those kind of forensic things. I'm kind of looking at it going, huh, you know, I wonder why that was a problem. And it's definitely bringing me back to the resolution to do more show quilting and show quilts because I'm, I'm ending up with these kinds of questions like what is going on? 
and I don't really know the answer. You know, is it that I'm quilting too densely? Is it that I'm leaving too much space open? Is it that my trapunto is too puffy and I need to use a thinner batting? I don't honestly know the answer to that. Uh, and that's frustrating. I would really like to know what exactly is causing these issues and how I can stop having them crop up in my quilts and you know, I don't know anybody that's like, yeah, I really want to spend four years making a show quilt and it be full of issues. Um, <laughs> you know, if that's not really what we want to do, but I think working smaller and quicker, I'll be able to answer this question and be able to have a lot more insight into why this is happening and not feel, you know, not feel like I've got to quilt it to death either. I'm looking at this going, you know, honestly, the, the areas that I love the most are the areas that are more evenly quilted. You know, these areas with uh, feathers in her hair. I really love that. So another thing that's just a little bit challenging as I work around this quilt is the fact that I am working in my not pretty <laughs> and yet to be renovated basement studio. And um, I'll be honest, uh, you know, thinking about more and more about social media and, you know, Facebook and Instagram and Pinterest and all that kind of stuff has really been making me think about, you know, this persona that we can put out into the world and it's very rarely honest um, this is you know my house low ceilings you know if somebody was six feet tall they'd be pretty uncomfortable standing where I am right now because the ceilings are so low um, it's dark you know I've not refinished the floors it's kind of dingy and it makes me uncomfortable because of course I want to show a nice beautiful uh, you know gorgeous sewing studio with lots of light and that whole nine yards. Uh, and, uh, you know, I actually went to uh, the YouTube channel, The Sewing Report, uh, Jen's channel, after she commented on my channel, I went and checked out hers. And she had done a video just the next day, just about, you know, authenticity and posting and sharing uh, our authentic selves, warts and all, ugly projects in progress. And of course, our real life sewing studios as they are, which is not gonna be gorgeous. So you're getting to see a lot of different angles <laughs> of a room that I very, very rarely show to anybody. Uh, and you know, it, it just, it's kind of one of those things. I want you to know that, you know, I feel the same way. If you're feeling, you know, uncomfortable about your sewing space and worried what other people will think, I feel the same way 90% of the time. And, uh, it, you know, we have, all have to make the best of it. Uh, we are all, you know, trying to figure things out and figure out how to make the quilts we want to make in the space that we have. So if you have a sewing room or a sewing studio and you feel kind of uncomfortable about it, trust me, I completely understand. Uh, I rarely shoot videos down here. And the main reason I am is because uh, I just feel like it's important to show this and to be authentic and especially Dream Goddess. This is a quilt that is all about that. Um, and I haven't really gotten into the inspiration for this quilt yet. The inspiration for Dream Goddess was um, just asking the simple question, what life do you want to have? It's a very simple question, but it's one that can drive you a little crazy because once you start asking that, you know, it, it, it pulls up a lot of different things. You know, what is unsatisfying about your life right now? Um, you know, what could be improved or, you know, and then does it even need to be improved? Uh, that kind of rabbit hole <laughs> that can, you can run down. Um, and, and I certainly don't mean to imply that anyone's life needs improvement. You know, to a large degree, I think most people are generally happy, uh, or at least I would hope so. But at least for me, whenever I started this quilt, I was reaching a point in my life and business where I was kind of like, okay, well, what's next? You know, I, I, I had been doing the same thing for quite some time and I was wondering, okay, is this, is this what I'm going to do forever? You know, is this, is this my life forever for the foreseeable future? You know, um, a new quilt along every year and a new video tutorials every week and, you know, kind of running the same kind of race against myself on a continual basis. And I didn't like that. You know, I love what I do, but I didn't like how I was doing things, if that makes any sense. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to run my business better 
more efficiently, uh, and in a way that would drive me less crazy. 2014, I was definitely feeling a little crazy. And Dream God is working on this quilt, asking myself that question on a regular basis really helped push me to making decisions that would stop me from driving myself crazy. Uh, also, you know, that was the year dad started working for me. And, you know, it kind of changes the entire game to suddenly have someone else that you need to tell them what to do. I could no longer, you know, have a big project stretched out over the entire table for months on end. I could no longer take over the entire room and leave a mess everywhere. I had another person needing space, another person coming in to help me, and I then needed to know what to tell dad to do for me to help me, you know? And it was, is it's a process of learning how to delegate and saying, okay, you have the skill to do this and I need to let it go, you know? That was a process to learn how to do that. So you might be wondering where these polystyrene boards go when I'm not using them for blocking. They are the back design wall for this room. And this is where we pin up a lot of our projects in progress. And this is honestly the cheapest, easiest way to have a design wall. I know this is a little loud, bear with me. So one of the benefits of, you know, having low ceilings and a not so nice basement is it's okay if I take pens and stick them straight in the ceiling. <laughs> so that's what I do. Uh, the boards have a tendency to fall forward off the wall. So that's how I keep them up. So that way they don't fall off. So that feels good. I got my polystyrene boards back up. They're back on the wall. I've got the quilt kind of rolled up a little bit. Now I can cut my facing. Uh, so yeah, this is kind of working. <laughs> I hope I'm making coherent sense as I tell you these stories about Dream Goddess. Uh, so yeah, it was a large part of it. I think at any stage in a business, you know, there, you have that initial phase. You have that, you know, just learning how to run the business kind of phase. Uh, and then there's a phase, you know, once everything kind of becomes routine and you kind of figure it out, and then there is a question of what comes next? You know, what is the next thing? And making Dream Goddess was a process of continually asking myself that question. What is the next thing? What am I doing? You know, and I've, and I've questioned and wondered about just about everything. You know, do I want to go back to traveling and teaching? You know, um, do I want to build a tiny house and live off the land? <laughs> I mean, they, I've considered a lot of different things, I gotta say. Uh, and what I've come back to time and time again is, you know, creating is just making new beautiful things, uh, sharing that in whatever way makes the most sense and just being open and creative. That is always my number one goal. And at least in the last year or so, as I've, I've really gotten closer and closer to finishing Dream Goddess, the main thing that I've been thinking about is, okay, how do I live a life that really supports me as I support it. And that's how I got into, uh, you know, Whole30, uh, living, uh, you know, eating better, eating uh, less, far less sugar, almost no sugar, uh, and uh, stop drinking in 2017, you know, making these choices that, you know, basically reflected that life that I wanted to live. The reason I quit drinking is I kept wondering, okay, I I'm trying to live this life that I want to live. Why am I trying to escape it with this drink in my hand? You know what I mean? Uh, and, and that was just a disconnect that finally made me start questioning that behavior more than anything else. And uh, the same thing with, you know, sugar. It was kind of like, well, uh, I was still sinking into that, that kind of feeling or that mentality like, oh, I, you know, I need something to help me relax. And I had to come back to and really dive into that and question that belief and say, I don't need something. I just need to learn how to relax. And working on Dream Goddess really did help me work on all of these issues and think about this. Now, that kind of constant questioning is not easy. You know, it is not easy to constantly be questioning and wondering these kinds of things. And sometimes I'd have to fold her up and put her away. Uh, and that's okay. You know, some quilts are more of a push than others. And particularly this series of goddess quilts, you know, some of them have had to go into timeout for a little while. It's like, well, maybe I'm not ready to learn that lesson quite yet. Uh, and maybe 
I just need a little bit more time to figure that out or to have the an you know right answers. With Dream Goddess, I know for a fact the reason why she got stuck, and she got stuck for a good two years, was only just a small section of quilting that was left to be quilted. And the main reason I think she got stuck is I left too many question marks in the quilt. And I've talked about this with my other show quilt and goddess quilt stories. Question marks in the design process, you know, are those things that maybe you're in a rush, in a hurry, don't want to think about it. Uh, I think in typical pattern design, it is the entire quilting design. You know, whenever you read quilt as desired, uh, that typically means that, uh, you know, someone was in too much of a hurry or just simply didn't have the skill to suggest a possible quilting design for that pattern. Uh, and that's the thing, you know, this kind of thing takes time and planning and um, being able to see all three layers, not just the piecing, not just the construction of the overall look of the quilt with colors, but also what what is that design and that pattern that is holding everything together. Uh, so it's tough. It's tough to continually be asking these questions and, and questioning myself and I think that's part of the reason why it took more time but then it's also those question marks I left in the quilt and it's basically that sunshine section I was talking about earlier. It was a problem. I decided I didn't want just feathers through that sunshine section. I wanted something more interesting. Throughout that quilt I had really pushed the envelope with design and I had gone weird in a way that I'd never allowed myself to go before. I mean, I put a third eye in the middle of the goddess's forehead. I'd never done that before and that felt I don't know. At the time, that, that made me feel uh, <laughs> like I was living on the wild side. I don't know. Um, and, you know, I felt like I went, I challenged myself and I went weird in a lot of ways with that quilt. But by the time I reached the sky section, I was in a rush to start quilting and I rushed it and I did not take my time with that section. And so I ended up with a lackluster quilting design that I never particularly liked. <laughs> And then, of course, ran into question marks in that area as well. So, so it was, it's asymmetrical. Some of those air, uh, fed, um, the rays of the sun are feathers, and they're pretty much symmetrical feathers filled in with some really dense quilting. That's easy, though. I mean, it's marked. It's trapuntoed. It's on the quilt. I, I know what I am quilting. I don't have to stop and think about it. I don't have to stop and guess. Well... The sections that I decided to go asymmetrical and not fill all of them in with feathers, I just thought, oh, well, I'll just pick my favorite quilting designs and stick it in those areas. I have created almost 500 quilting designs, and let me just say, it is hard to pick. <laughs> it is hard to pick my favorites. I mean, I know there's a handful that I go back to time and time again, but that's only a handful, and I needed at least... I think about a dozen designs to go in that area. And, and that's the thing, that's too big of a question mark left open. That is too big of a decision to be left to the quilting process. Uh, I had an opportunity once to quilt the same quilt. It was a small baby quilt three different times. And I was really surprised by what I found because I was pretty much timing myself as I went. You know, how many days does it take to go from start to finish on this quilt? Because I was on a time limit, I kind of paid attention to it. And I found the quilt that had the most question marks still open. It was basically like a free form collage quilting style where I'm, I'd basically quilt a cluster of a design and then I'd have to stop and look at the quilt and make a decision over and over and over again. That one took the most time because that stopping and decision making was taxing. I mean, I know that sounds weird, but it is hard to make decisions like that on a quilt. It's hard to take that time, especially when you're in the middle of the quilting process. It's kind of like when you wait to eat until you are starving, hungry, and hangry, and mad, then it's like, okay, I will eat anything. Like, I don't care what it is. I will eat anything. Like, you know, give me a donut. I'm so mad. Um, you don't let yourself get to that point. <laughs> Just a tip. Uh, you know, you don't leave the quilting design and those types of decisions to the very, very end because by that point, can't make decisions anymore. I mean, I can't make decisions anymore. Maybe you're better at it than I am, but I can't make decisions anymore. I just want, I want it figured out for me so that I can just sink into the quilting process and enjoy myself, stitch on the marked lines and be done with it. 
of those three quilts, there were three quilts, baby quilts, all pieced the exact same way, all quilted differently. The quilt that was marked, every single element on that quilt was marked, went the fastest. And it surprised me. I really was not expecting that. That was, that was a shocker. And had that, knowing that, has influenced my quilting ever since. Because now I know I need every single answer. I need every single detail figured out. And that's overwhelming in and of itself. I mean, that's kind of hard to do. It's like, you know, if I gave myself the task, like, hey, Leah, here's an 80 inch quilt, figure out every single quilting design, you know, that needs to go into it right now, right this second, I'd have a hard time. This is something that should take weeks, you know, however long it took to design the piecing design should be as long as it takes to design the quilting design. You know, it's a time consuming process. That doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It's just, it's a process. We need time to think about it and time to mull it over. At least I do. I need to be able to draw something and come back to it and draw something and come back to it. I'm very much a, like my brain's chewing on it in some deep recess part of my brain. Uh, and I need to be able to come back to that over and over again, where it's like, oh, you know, my brain was chewing on it. I don't particularly like that tree design or I don't particularly like that that leaf design. I wanna come back to that. I wanna tweak it a little bit. I wanna make that more open. I wanna make that more closed. You know, I'm constantly thinking about it, but the only way I can be constantly thinking about it is if I've given myself that task and said, this door is not closed until everything's done. And then it's no longer a rush, 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 let's, let's go do it, let's go you know, speed through the process. It's much more slow, it's much more methodical. And I gotta say, it's much easier to actually make the real quilt. It's much more enjoyable. The whole process is so much more enjoyable. So at this stage, I have cut out my facing strips at four inches wide. And now I am folding over a half of an inch and I need to figure out how I wanna measure that. I only have like seven rulers <laughs> right around me, but it's not the right one. I think I like this one. There we go. So I'm gonna use this as my guide and fold up my edge fold over the edge of the facing by a half of an inch and give it a nice press. And uh, yeah, went on ahead and starched this fabric three times. So it is practically standing up on its own. Look at that, it is standing up on its own. That is the value of starch. It is some good stuff, baby, and it is absolutely worth it to do it that way. Um, I know that not only will these folds hold in place better, It'll be so much easier to work with and do the hand stitching because there's this stiffness. Now I am considering adding even more stiffness to the facing or to the back edges of the quilt. Uh, I mentioned that there was a steaming process involved uh, and some of the quilt wasn't wanting to lay flat. So what I'm thinking about doing is adding some boning to the top and bottom edges of the quilt Boning is used to make corsets, and I have some of it for exactly that reason. I was gonna make a corset for a costume. Haven't gotten around to it yet, so I've got all this boning laying around, uh, and that seems like a pretty good idea. I can hide it uh, in the facing. I can I put it right up against the quilt, uh, if I want the back of the quilt if I want to, and hide it in the facing. Uh, that would certainly add a rigid line across the top and bottom edges. Uh, so if there was any kind of rippliness going on, if there was an issue with the fabric not behaving, then I think the, the boning would certainly reinforce that top edge of the quilt and possibly help it hang better, you know? Uh, it is looking a lot better now than it was whenever I first put it in, you know, got it out and put it, spread it out over the table. Uh, steaming really can help if you have quilts with, you know, wavy edges. Uh, steaming, just put some water in your iron and, and do a little bit of steaming along the edge. You'll find that it will lay down flat. You just wanna let it dry all the way before you pick up your quilt. Again, um, steam, it's kind of like it makes the fabric relax. If you then pick up your quilt and start manipulating it or you start manipulating the fabric, you can easily distort it. Uh, so you gotta be careful with that. 
If you're steaming, make sure that the quilt's flat, it's spread out. I, you know, penned it uh, all over the place too, and then let it dry completely before you start moving it around again. Because, uh, you know, it can create some distortion. I think a lot of times borders are especially tricky on quilts because we're kind of, we're a little bit too rough with our borders, especially when we're quilting them. Uh, and it's really easy to torque that fabric out of shape and not even realize that you're doing it. Uh, and that's a, a question that comes up quite a bit uh, in uh, via email and on comments, you know, just, you know, hey, why is my border wavy? You know, what did I do wrong? And the answer is, you know, just probably just a little bit too rough with it, but it's the stretch of the fabric. It's it's manipulating it through the machine. Usually when you're on the edge of the quilt, you're, you know, kind of pushing and forcing it around quite a bit more than you probably would the center of the quilt. And by the time you reach the borders, you know, it's a lot less precious. <laughs> so all of those reasons. But if you have a border that is particularly wavy, no, please know that you can get it back in control with just some steam. And I don't usually use steam. Uh, that's why I have a, an external handheld steamer. I do not put water in my irons usually. If you do put water in an iron that you have not had water in ever before or not in a long, long time, make sure to turn on the steam setting and let it run through for a while. Put it down, let it steam, pick it up, let it steam, keep alternating because you know some iron suddenly starts spewing black water like the exorcist and it's not cool uh, and it that stuff can stain i don't even know what it is what causes the water to go black like that but it's scary and not any fun um, i'd say if if you're into this if you're into steaming at all if you like to use that a uh, little $20 handheld steamer. I found mine, I think, at Walmart. <laughs> I originally bought it for steaming wigs for cosplay. I know, kind of weird, um, but definitely a good investment. Definitely something that's worth it. Uh, just so that way it keeps the water out of your iron. I have irons that have lasted for years because they didn't have any water in them. That It's the water that breaks the iron, basically. And it causes the parts to wear out much, much more quickly and the whole thing to fall apart. So one last reason why I think Dream Goddess stayed in this unfinished state is this exact facing process. Uh, and, and this is something that I think is important to talk about. And that is, you know, sometimes we can pick a technique or know that we want to try a technique. And sometimes that's really exciting. You know, there are times where I'm like, yeah, I want to do, you know, cording or I want to do, um, an open hole in my quilt or, you know, I want to uh, do some awesome trapunto and like multiple layers, maybe traplique, which is a mixture of trapunto and applique. You know, there's times when, you know, trying out something new is the exciting new thing and the exciting part that you're really, really looking forward to. And then sometimes it doesn't feel that way. Sometimes it's a, gosh, you know, that quilt, I really have to use that technique. And I haven't done that in a few years. And I don't know how that's going to go. And, you know, but if I, you know, what are the alternatives? You kind of weigh the alternatives. And that was the case with this. It was like, you know, yeah, sure. I could use this blue fabric that I saved for four years <laughs> for the, you know, binding. I could use this and do regular traditional binding. But it just really wouldn't look the same. It just really wouldn't look as good uh, because this is more of an art quilt and it really does need to go all the way to the edges. It doesn't need any sort of border to it. And I didn't really want any sort of edge or border to draw the eye. I really wanted it to be, uh, you know, more like a painting in that sense. And, you know, so sometimes the technique can be the thing that lights, you know, the fire in your pants <laughs> and, and really makes you excited about a project. And sometimes it's not. And I think the key is identifying which, you know, how you're feeling about it and to work on that. And I can already tell you, you know, I'm prepping this up and I'm getting everything ready to go. And then I'm going to set it aside and run a full test. I have three Eternal Love Goddess quilts that are unbound. <laughs> this is the thing, like I can run a whole quilt along and share, you know, a quilt step by step, but that doesn't mean I have to finish it. Um, you know, sometimes life gets in the way and I just have to set the project aside and it doesn't necessarily get done. And I set those dream goddess quilts aside knowing, hey, I might be able to use that as a test for that technique. So that way I'm not testing the technique on something that is 
you know, 60 inches long. Uh, you don't want to test anything that big. And Dream God, uh, sorry, um, the Eternal Love Goddesses are 20 by 25. Pretty good size, I think, to test these tech, you know, this binding, this uh, facing technique. And then I can work out between the two of them, I can work out any issues and kind of come up with a game plan that's really solid. And, you know, that's one of those things. Uh, I think it's good to constantly be developing your skills. It's good to have a push. I think a lot of the reason why I hesitated to finish this quilt for so long is that learning something new is exhausting. It's tiring. And when you feel depleted already and tired already, taking on that extra stuff is extra. And it just feels like, oh gosh, you know, I can barely finish this quilt. I absolutely cannot go and, you know, learn this technique and struggle through, you know, uh, testing it and struggle through these, you know, you know, binding several test quilts and, you know, whatever. And it's easy to inflate it in your head. And I think that's what I was doing. I was inflating it in my head a little bit. It's also, I think, a testament to tapping into where you're at with your energy level. And, and this is, I think, part of the reason why I'm focusing more on my health and exercise and paying more attention to how I'm feeling at any given time uh, and, you know, eating the right foods that will make me feel good and not crash halfway through the day. Uh, and, you know, at this stage, once I, it's kind of like I was talking about in the intro, that starting energy versus finishing energy. And I just think I just was really depleted and unable to tap into the finishing energy on this project until I finished Mally the Maker. And then it was like, oh, wow, you know, what else can I finish? And then, you know, could I finish something that I don't think I could, you know, ever finish? And I kind of was seeing how far I could take it. And I think that's good too. We can surprise ourselves by how little we can get done. And I think we can also surprise ourselves by how much we can get done in a short space of time. Uh, I know there was a year, 2010 was an amazing year. I got two huge goddess quilts done. I showed, I, I won some major awards and shows. I, you know, I, 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 I look back on that year and I'm like, how did I do all of that and run my business and have a three-year-old, you know, kind of and a, and a, and a, all of these different things. And, and I look back on that year and kind of like, huh, who was that girl? <laughs> you know, so even I'm thinking that sometimes when I look back on things that have happened uh, in the past. And maybe I'll be looking back on 2018 and feeling the same way. Uh, but my word for the year is challenge. And I think this year especially I can look back and say, hey, you know, I was rising to the challenge. This is hard and I, you know, I can honestly say I'm not quite sure what I'm doing. I'm guessing, I'm making the best educated guess that I possibly can. Uh, I'm running through the steps the best way I know how and I'm gonna test and play and I'm gonna make it fun. Uh, I've got some e um, audiobooks I've downloaded to listen to and I wanna make it fun so that way as I'm working through this, if it doesn't end up working out, if I'm gonna to need to you know, spend some time ripping, it's going to be okay. And it's not the end of the world if it doesn't come out perfect either. I feel like at this stage, you know, with Dream Guys, it's like, well, if she doesn't hang absolutely perfect, is that the end of the world? No, I'm still gonna love her. You know, I love what this quote represents. Uh, I love what she means to me. I cannot wait to see her on my wall. And I guess that's part of it too, that desire to see this quote finished and complete is at this stage pretty overwhelming. You know, I cannot wait to see it all put together and done. And I think that focusing in on that can help finish projects more than anything else. Like, okay, you know, not just that, hey, here's this project in a bin that it would be nice if I finished it, but just like, wow, that would be so awesome that it's complete and I can, you know, give it away or I can do this thing with it that I've been meaning to do for years or I can enter it in a show if I want to, you know, that whole nine yards. So this has been quite a story and quite a process of, you know, just, you know, getting this quilt to this point of facing, uh, talking through my fears with it. You know, I'm, I'm still not sure how this is gonna go. I haven't put a stitch in the facing yet and I haven't cut the edges of the quilt yet. 
uh, squaring this monster up is going to be interesting in and of itself. And I already know any extra bits that I cut off, if it's wide enough to play with, I'm probably going to turn that into jewelry or I might, I don't know, figure out some way of turning that into something else, maybe part of a bag, uh, made those zipper pouches before. So I'm definitely going to use the pieces that I cut off the quilt for something creative. Uh, yeah, and it, you know, I think it's important to understand that no quilt is perfect. And certainly making this quilt, having four years into it and seeing, you know, how this has played a role in my life. And there have been times that I'm just like, I can't even look at that thing right now. You know, I just felt frustrated by the whole question of what life do you want to live? Because I didn't feel like I was living that life. I felt like my life was you know, my business or my life was controlling me, not the other way around. And especially right now, I think this is just fortuitous that it all ended up coming together at the right time. Uh, I really feel like I'm doing what I set out to do in 2014. And that is to live a creative, abundant life. It's not perfect. It's sometimes very hard, <laughs> you know? I don't think that it's meant to be easy. It's not meant to be easy all the time, uh, but, I'm ready to rise to the challenge, and that's what I love the most. So I hope that you've enjoyed this quilt story and seeing me working on the facing and this whole process of Dream Goddess. Uh, if you have any questions about this process, please post in the comments below. I'll be happy to answer your questions. And of course, please come and find more podcast episodes at leahday.com slash podcast. Until next time, let's go quilt. <laughs>